Dr. Jason Wu is the head of rheumatology at the Orthopedic Institute of New Jersey. He is double board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine and Internal Medicine as well as rheumatology. Dr. Wu received his rheumatology fellowship training from Winthrop University Hospital in Mineola, New York and Nassau University Medical Center in East Meadow, New York. He completed his internal medicine residency at Winthrop Hospital, excuse me, Winthrop University Hospital. He earned his medical degree as well as his master's in clinical nutrition from the New York College of Osteopathic Medicine in Old Westbury, New York, where he received numerous honors during his studies. Dr. Wu completed his undergraduate degree at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey, where he was also recognized as a George H. Cook Honor Scholar. He is a member of the National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners, the American College of Rheumatology, and the American College of Physicians. In addition, he holds a membership in the American Osteopathic Association. Uh, currently, Dr. Wu is going to give us an update on osteoporosis. I think osteoporosis is at a very interesting time right now. Uh, there's a lot of controversy and debate among phys amongst physicians who we should be treating, how long we should be treating for, uh, what agents we should be treating patients with. Coupled that with some bad publicity on um, uh, the medications for osteoporosis, and you have a lot of fear and confusion amongst patients. Also, osteoporosis is more of a preventive uh, condition. It's not tangible. You're not treating something that, like joint pain or vision loss or even diabetes. You're treating something to prevent fractures that may or may not happen in the future. So sometimes it's very, very hard to convince patients to get on board with these treatments, especially after they hear some of the adverse, uh, the devastating adverse side effects of the medications. Um, with that said, I think that's why it's very important that we know the evidence-based uh, medicine behind osteoporosis, some of the recommendations, uh, like why do we even talk about drug holidays uh, to begin with. Uh, once we know the evidence-based literature, then, then we could really give our patients the most up-to-date and accurate information, because ultimately, uh, they're going to decide who, uh, what, uh, ultimately, they're going to decide uh, what they want, if they want to be treated for osteoporosis and with what agents they want to be treated with. So I have no disclosures. Uh, so the objectives today, I'm going to go over a general overview of osteoporosis uh, and who we really should be treating for osteoporosis. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about into the bisphosphonates and who should get a drug holiday. Then near the end, I'm going to talk about some of the newer agents, uh, the bone biologics, uh, parathyroid hormone therapy, uh, how they're different, what's the latest updates on those uh, medications. So here are current treatments for osteoporosis. Uh, the first one being conservative therapy. Uh, we have lifestyle modifications, calcium, vitamin D, uh, weight-bearing exercises. Uh, then we get into the medications. Um, we have calcitonin, which is the calcitonin nasal spray, which is one of the weaker agents. Uh, I think this medication's kind of fallen out of favor recently, especially with the, with the new uh, or, or the fairly recent warning that it might cause malignancy uh, risk. Uh, so I don't really use it too much anymore. Sometimes I do prescribe it for patients who are complaining of bony pain uh, from a compression fracture because there might be some data uh, that it could relieve some of the bony pain if you use it for about one or two years. Uh, the next one is selective estrogen receptor modulators. Raloxifen is the big one in this list. Um, I do use this sometimes. It is weaker, but I do use it uh, if the patient comes in with a DEXA that's not too bad, uh, and especially if they have a family history of GYN cancer, since it could be preventative in that. Um, on a side note, uh, you're not supposed to give raloxifen, obviously, with tamoxifen if the patient is on tamoxifen. Then we get into the infamous uh, bisphosphonates. Um, we'll definitely talk about that. Uh, and then parathyroid hormone. The one on the market we have is teriparatide, or the brand name is Forteo. Uh, this is an anabolic agent, so it's different from the rest of these uh, agents on the list um, because it's actually the only one that actually stimulates bone formation, whereas the other ones are all anti-resorptive agents. Uh, so the other ones on the list, the, the way they work in osteoporosis is that they decrease the breakdown of bone in osteoporosis, whereas parathyroid hormone, uh, it actually increases the bone forming uh, process in the body. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And then uh, finally, uh, the bone biologics. Feels like almost every, every condition has a biologic agent these days, and osteoporosis is no different. Uh, the one on the market we have is denosumab, uh, and, and the brand name is Prolia for that one. So here are just some lifestyle modifications. I tell my patient, uh, ACCESS leads to osteoporosis, short acronym. 
so alcohol use, corticosteroid use, cal uh, low calcium, low estrogen, smoking, and sedentary lifestyles. Uh, you could also add uh, caffeine to one of those Cs. Uh, and every osteoporosis evaluation and every osteoporosis visit should uh, review all these lifestyle uh, risk factors. Uh, so this is something called the FRAX tool. Uh, for those who don't know about the FRAX tool, uh, it's really a tool used to calculate the risk of fractures in osteopenic patients. Uh, people who are osteoporosis on the bone density, so anyone that has a T-score less than negative 2.5 or lower, um, they, they already have a very high risk of fractures, so you really don't have to calculate this tool. They should be placed on medications. Also, people who have a, a history of a fragility fracture in the hip or the compression fracture in the spine, they have a high risk of having a recurrent fracture, so you don't even have to calculate the FRAX uh, score for, for those patients. But uh, for, for people that's in the gray area uh, on their bone density, uh, in that osteopenic range from negative 1 to negative 2.5, this is a handy tool. Uh, so you go to their, uh, you go to their website, um, you calculate, uh, you put in their age, sex, weight, height, answer some yes or no questions on their uh, risk factors, and then you enter their bone density and hit calculate. And you'll get, it'll, it'll give you two numbers. The, the risk of a major osteoporosis parotic fracture over the next 10 years, and uh, uh, the risk of a, having a hip fracture in the next 10 years. And we'll get a little bit more into that uh, a little later on. Uh, but once, I want to talk a little bit more about monitoring therapy. So the gold standard is still bone density or DEXA. Um, I do get asked a lot of questions about bone turnover markers from physicians. Um, so they, they asked me like where, where I think uh, it, it could be used in clinical practice. Unfortunately, I don't think it's bone turnover markers are very good right now in, in, clinical, in the clinical setting. However, the National Bone Health Alliance does have an ongoing project. They're trying to standardize how we collect these bone turnover markers. Um, and also they're trying to establish a reference range. Uh, and they're working on the two major ones right now, uh, P1NP, which is a bone forming marker and CTX, which is a bone resorption marker. Uh, so these are the two that uh, a lot of associations have agreed that they're most likely to help in clinical use. Um, so uh, it's an ongoing project, and I think it is on the horizon, but I think right now there's just a lot of variability between patients uh, with these markers, so they're not very good at predicting fracture risk uh, that we know of, and there's really no guidelines for them right now. However, I do think they are helpful in the research setting. Uh, during the osteoporosis trials, uh, a lot of bone turnover markers were collected, and we really have gotten a lot of information on how our medications work in osteoporosis based on, this, uh, based on the, turnover, uh, the bone turnover markers. So I think it's really helpful uh, in, in the research setting, but as of now, uh, in, in the clinical setting, we don't really have any great guidelines or, or recommendations. So I'm going to talk about who we really should be treating for osteoporosis. So the National Osteoporosis Foundation actually came out with two recommendations uh, fairly close to each other, one in 2003 and one in 2008. Uh, and, and in 2003, they came out with a set of rec uh, recommendations, but I think um, over the next five years, uh, they, they were under a lot of pressure because there was a lot of more information about um, uh, all these side effects of the bisphosphonates, so they wanted, uh, they were under a lot of pressure to become a little more selective in who we treat for osteoporosis. So back in 2003, uh, the National Osteoporosis Foundation recommended that anyone with a T-score uh, on bone density of le less than negative 2.0 uh, should be treated for osteoporosis. And remember, uh, less than negative 2.5 is considered osteoporosis. So, so even some, some of the patients that aren't osteoporotic and did not have a risk factor, uh, were recommended to be treated. Uh, and then anyone with a T-score of less than negative 1.5 with one risk factor, that they were recommended to be treated for osteoporosis. And one risk factor could mean that they were underweight or they had a family history of having a fracture. Um, so if you think amongst your own patient populations, uh, all the postmenopausal women in your own practices, um, you probably have a majority of those postmenopausal women fit this 2003 recommendation um, to, to be treated for osteoporosis. Uh, so that's why 
over the next several years, they really wanted them to be a little bit more selective. And then in 2008, a, a new set of guidelines came out, which I think did a better job. Um, so they said, treat all defined osteoporosis patients. These are all the patients that on bone density have uh, less than negative 2.5 uh, or worse. Um, and also any, anyone, especially the elderly patients who had developed a fragility fracture, hip compression fracture in the spine, those, all those patients should be treated for osteoporosis. And then if they were in that gray area, like I said, if they were osteopenic, this is where the FRAC score comes in. And you want a FRAC score with a 10-year major osteoporotic fracture risk of over 20% or a 10-year hip fracture risk of 3% uh, or more. And those are the people that you should be treating for osteoporosis. So this became a little more selective. An example of how selective uh, it was, uh, there was a one study that actually uh, took all the women from an NHANES 3 cohort survey. The NHANES 3 survey was done in like the 90s. So they took all the women who filled out that survey and they applied the 2003 guidelines and the 2008 guidelines towards them. And they found of all those postmenopausal women who took the survey, um, based on the 2003 guidelines, 55% of those patients should be treated for osteoporosis. And a majority of those 55% of patients were in their 50s and 60s. Uh, if you use the 2008 guidelines, only 30% of those patients uh, were recommended to be treated. So there was a 50%, um, they, they became 50% more selective on who they wanted to treat. And the majority of those 30%, uh, based on the 2008 guidelines, uh, were, were in their 70s. So it's important because, uh, as we all know probably, that, that uh, the side effects of the medications of bisphosphonates go up uh, as the longer you are using them. So if you start someone on bisphosphonate, bisphosphonate therapy at 50 years old, um, you're, you might run into some problems when, when they get into 70s and 80s. So having said that, um, I think the guidelines became a little too selective. Um, uh, this is a graph of people who started osteoporosis medications after uh, any hip fracture. And uh, this is all hip fractures, but you could assume that most of them were fragility fractures. So in 2002, uh, you can see 40% of uh, patients uh, were started on osteoporosis medications after, uh, after developing a hip fracture, which is an okay number. Um, not a great number, but okay. Uh, but then over the next 10 years, you could see uh, osteoporosis medications decline, uh, and, and up to 2011, uh, only 21% of people who developed a hip fracture was started on osteoporosis medication uh, after their fracture, and this is really not acceptable. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing to say that even, uh, even working in an orthopedic institute uh, myself, uh, I don't get that many uh, osteoporosis evaluations after having a hip fracture. Uh, so, so we do have to do better uh, in this regard. Um, I think the awareness is getting a little bit better, though. Uh, some of my newer ortho colleagues who, who are getting board certified uh, and they have to have their cases reviewed by the board, uh, one of the things on their checklist um, is that if, if they did a hip fracture replacement, um, they, they have to have an osteoporosis evaluation. So I think it's gotten better. I think over the last five years, this number might have increased a little bit, uh, but still it's a major problem. A lot of people get lost to follow up. Uh, they get their hip, uh, hip replaced and they go to a, a long-term rehab facility. And after they get discharged, uh, they, they have other problems to worry about. And what's the reason why we kind of had this decline uh, over the past years? I kept saying, talking about the side effects of bisphosphonates. Uh, so these are the major ones that I think scare a lot of people. Uh, so the atypical femur fractures, uh, especially the risk increases with longer duration of use. Uh, it's hard to convince someone to get the medication if you tell them, I want you to take this medication uh, to prevent fractures from happening. But one of the side effects is that it could increase the risk of fractures. So, um, so, so a lot of uh, patients aren't too happy with that, obviously. Uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw, I think that's the one that's gotten a lot of publicity over the past 10 years. 
uh, and, and press. But I think um, this is extremely rare condition, but I think since it's so much uh, publicity, I think all the patients who have any dental uh, symptoms, uh, they, they attribute all their dental symptoms to bisphosphonate use or osteoporosis use. So they sometimes come in and they said, oh, that Fosamax, it, it gave me such bad TMJ, and we know TMJ doesn't really have an association with bisphosphonate use. But osteonecrosis of the jaw is a true association with bisphosphonates, but it is extremely rare. More than 90% of people who get, uh, who get osteonecrosis of the jaw are cancer patients, and cancer patients get probably like 10 times the doses of normal, uh, normal osteoporosis patients. Um, so over 90% of, uh, of people who get osteonecrosis of the jaw are the cancer patients. And even in the people who aren't cancer patients, there's only less than 10% of them. And uh, usually they have already poor dental hygiene, and they, uh, they usually develop it right after oral surgery. Uh, so we work with the dentist or the oral surgeon, and sometimes we have to stop the medication if needed. And then uh, a more recent uh, link to bisphosphonates is esophageal cancer, but an FDA panel uh, judged this association to be inconclusive. And just going back on the atypical femur fractures a little bit, uh, just how common are they? Uh, so, so really in the first one to two years, if you are on a bisphosphonate, the atypical femur fracture rate is pretty non-existent. It's 1.8 out of 100,000 person years. Uh, so that's really uh, nothing. Uh, but if you're on the bisphosphonate for over eight years, uh, you see that the incidence rate of atypical femur fracture does go up from 1.8 to 113. So it is true that you do get a higher incidence of atypical femur fractures uh, the longer you are on this medication. However, this rate is still, is still extremely rare compared to a typical osteoporosis patient uh, and their rate of having a regular hip fracture is 750 to 833 per 100,000 person years. So when you talk to patients about starting treatments and if they're really concerned about having an atypical femur fracture, you say we really have to decrease this number and not worry about this number as much since this one is much higher. When you do start the bisphosphonate, um, you do definitely get a decreased incidence of hip fractures. You go from 750 to 800 down to 463 after only one year of bisphosphonate use. And then after two to three years, um, it, it continues to go down a little bit more. Uh, but after a while though, this is the interesting part, uh, after a while, uh, if you're on the medication for about four to seven years, <laughs> Uh, there's really no more decrease in fracture risk uh, after that. Uh, so, so this is kind of where the whole drug holiday starts coming into play. Um, so what is a drug holiday? Pretty much it's the stoppage of osteoporosis treatment uh, for a certain amount of time. And it should be only for a temporary period of time. Uh, drug holiday is a holiday. There's no such thing as a permanent holiday. If there was, sign me up. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, all holidays must usually end, so you do really have to reassess uh, if they need to restart treatment or not. Sometimes I get a patient, and they come in, and they said, oh, I was treated uh, with uh, Fosamax in the past, and, but I'm, now I'm on a drug holiday. And I say, oh, good, how long ago was that? And they say, like, 10, 10 to 12 years. Uh, so so uh, it is important to keep reassessing uh, if they re really need to restart treatment. And drug holidays only apply to bisphosphonates, and we'll talk about why they don't apply to some of the other agents uh, later on. Uh, so why give a drug holiday? I already touched on this a little bit, uh, but some of the reasons. So you start them on a bisphosphonate, and their bone density responds so well, maybe their bone density becomes normal now, and they have a very low risk of fracture, and they might not need the medication anymore. Also, I touched on this, uh, the side effect profile therapy becomes high, so the longer you use it, the higher the side effect profile becomes, and then eventually maybe it outweighs the benefit of giving the medication. Also, the drug is no longer effective. On that uh, previous two slides, uh, I showed that uh, after four to five years of use, um, there, there really was no further benefit of, uh, of fracture risk reduction, at least in the hip. Uh, and also, maybe the drug's not needed. There's actually uh, an interesting thing with bisphosphonates. There's a residual effect after you uh, discontinue the medication. I'll show you this in, in, in the studies in future slides, but um, 
if you stop the bisphosphonates, it can actually linger on after you discontinue it. And this is uh, more so for alendronate and zolendronic acid, uh, more so than uh, residronate and uh, ibanadrate. But, that, uh, but for these reasons, it led to a statement by the FDA in 2011, uh, this limitation of use statement. They say optimal duration of use has not been determined, which is true. We really don't have a good guideline on how long we should be treating these uh, osteoporosis patients for. Um, all patients on bisphosphonates should have the need for continued therapy reevaluated at a periodic basis, so that's true. We should be uh, monitoring every one to two years and seeing if they need to continue the bisphosphonates. But they even went as far, uh, one, one FDA member actually on an interview said, there was no clear benefit in women who continued bisphosphonate therapy after five years, nor was there a clear and consistent reduction in fracture risk. Um, I know where she kind of, uh, I know where she was kind of coming from, but um, it's kind of an unfair statement, and when she said something like this, obviously the press takes that out of proportion, out of context, and then patients come in and say, oh, the FDA said I don't have to continue this medication for more than five years, which is not true of everyone. Obviously, some people could go on a drug holiday, uh, but the people who have very, very high risk of fractures, uh, they should probably still be continued on some form of treatment, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So we're going to get into the really the, the clinical based, uh, medic, uh, the evidence based medicine uh, on, on the drug holidays and I'm really going to discuss uh, two major trials um, where the results were fairly similar but they were long term trials. Uh, the first one is the FLEX long term extension. It was a long term trial of alendronate uh, or Fosamax. Uh, so it was a total of 10 years. The second one is the Horizon PFT extension, uh, which is a long-term trial of solandronic acid, which is the IV bisphosphonate reclassed, and that went on for six years. So here uh, is the FLEX trial. Uh, this is the 10-year trial with uh, uh, alendronate. Um, the FLEX trial stands for uh, the FIT long-term extension. The FIT trial, uh, the original FIT trial was a five-year study between alendronate and placebo. Uh, so we could take this first uh, two, two graphs, okay? This was uh, bone density in the total hip, and zero is baseline. And if you give alendronate uh, to these patients, you see that after one, two, three years of use, the bone density c continues to go up in the total hip. However, uh, the FLEX trial did a long-term extension. They extended the trial out for five years. The people who got alendronate in the original trial, they were then randomized to two different groups, one that continued the alendronate for, for five more years and another group that discontinued the alendronate. And you could see the, the black dots are the ones that continued the alendronate. There was really no further benefit in, in uh, bone density change um, if you continued the alendronate. If you discontinued the alendronate, so these are pretty much the people who, who go on a drug holiday, they, the bone density does drop and continue to drop all the way back to baseline in the total hip at five years. But it does linger on, and it takes five years to actually go back to, to the baseline uh, bone density. Um, if you take the, the femoral neck data, uh, so again, it continues to go up about to the four or five year mark. Then if you continue, there's no further change in bone density. If you discontinue, you can see it did decrease a little bit, but it never goes back to baseline. So, so you definitely see some lingering effect of uh, alendronate here, even after five years of discontinuing the medication. And I'm also gonna, uh, here's the lumbar spine. Usually the lumbar spine is where we get the most robust changes in, in bone density with the medications. Uh, so you can see that after four or five years of use, it goes up to about 8% change from baseline bone density in the lumbar spine. Even if you continue the alendronate, you do get a continued benefit in bone density change all the way up to maybe about 12%. But if you stop the alendronate, there really was no decrease in bone density uh, even five years after uh, uh, discontinuing the alendronate in the lumbar spine. Uh, so you, that definitely shows that there is some form of lingering effect uh, with bisphosphonates. And the theory behind this is um, we believe uh, that the bisphosphonates, uh, they bind to the bony matrix very, very well. So even after discontinuing the medication, when the body starts uh, uh, resorbing the bone again and breaking down the bone, uh, the, the bisphosphonate that bound to the bone gets released back into the system and continued their effects on, on the body.
so, so that's all fine and dandy with the bone density, but what does that mean for uh, risk reduction in fractures? So they did see a significant difference between alendronate and placebo group in clinical vertebral fractures, where the people who continued the alendronate for two years, only 2.4% of them had a clinical vertebral fracture, whereas the people who stopped alendronate after five years and took a drug holiday, per se, 5.3% uh, of them developed a clinical fra vertebral fracture. And although this difference was kind of small, the, it was statistically significant. Uh, so clinical vertebral fractures um, might benefit. Maybe it has to do with that if you continue giving alendronate, you continue, doing, um, continue changing the bone density, uh, whereas in the hip and the femoral neck, you really don't change bone density much. But there was really no significant difference in vertebral morphometric fractures, non-vertebral fractures, or hip fractures. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons, since there's no further risk reduction in these fractures, this is one of the reasons why some people might qualify for a drug holiday. And then this is the Horizon uh, PFT extension trial, which is uh, with the solandronic acid. Um, very, very similar. Uh, here, here are the bone density graphs. Uh, very, very similar to the, to the FLEX trial, where uh, the first three years they got uh, IV reclass or zolandronic acid, uh, and it, it went up in all the patients up until about the three-year mark. But if you continue giving the bisphosphonate, uh, it really plateaus, maybe goes up a little bit in the lumbar spine. In this trial, though, when they stopped the medication, all of them, all, all these uh, patients who stopped the medications, they never went back to the baseline bone density. I don't know if it projects that well on the screen, but um, there's a dotted line here that shows the people who discontinued the medication. They never really go back down to baseline. And you can see the same here. So really, they're, they're lingering effects of bisphosphonates on the body. And here are the bone turnover markers. In this study, they, they took bone turnover markers. So just so we're on the same page on home, how bone turn, turnover markers work in these medications. So these are anti-resorptive agents, so they stop the breaking down of, uh, of bone, and that's how they treat osteoporosis. So you expect when you start treating them, the bone resorption markers go down. Uh, and, but there's also a reciprocal effect where if bone breakdown decreases, bone forming decreases. So the bone forming markers also go down as well too. Uh, so bone resorption markers, bone formation, they all go down when you start with the treatment uh, of solandronic acid. But even after discontinuation, these bone turnover markers never change from if you continue the treatment. So there has to be some kind of lingering effect that, that really affects the bone turnover. Uh, where, where the bone turnover never goes back to, to where they were in the beginning and, and why the bone density doesn't change. So in 2014, uh, Bauer uh, did a study to try to categorize who really qualifies for a drug holiday. Um, and and he, took, uh, he, he took the group from the FLEX trial. He took these patients who had alendronate for five years and then discontinued the alendronate. Uh, so these are pretty much the drug holiday patients over here. Uh, he took all these patients and he compared the patients that developed a fracture when they stopped the medication, compared it with uh, patients who didn't develop a fracture and see if he could find any similar, uh, similar characteristics. He didn't really find too much. He did see that maybe the people who stopped uh, or who started a drug holiday at an older age uh, had a higher risk of fractures. So the people who stopped the medication and developed the fracture, their average age was 76.2. Uh, and those people who stopped the medication and did not develop a fracture, their, their age was 73.1. Uh, so that was statistically significant. Uh, also, uh, he saw that uh, if you discontinued the medication uh, when their DEXA score or their T-score was still negative 2.3 or less, they had a higher risk of uh, fractures uh, in their drug holiday period. Also, uh, he, he went to see if there was any increased risk um, on the drug holiday uh, on when to restart uh, uh, treatment. And he found that if at the two-year mark, if you do a bone density and the, uh, and the total hip decreases more than 3%, uh, there was an increased risk of fractures. Uh, unfortunately, he also took a look at bone turnover markers, and it was really unreliable in determining fracture risk. Uh, so that's why I say it's probably still not uh, very good in use in clinical setting. Uh, 
Uh, it could have also been a power issue, though, because uh, I think there was only like 94 people uh, that developed fractures in the study. So uh, for maybe the last 10, 15 minutes, we'll get into some of the newer agents. Uh, I want to get into bone biologics first. Uh, the one we have on the market right now is called denosumab, uh, or Prolia, uh, if you've heard of it. It's an injection once every six months. Uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, agent. Uh, it works by inhibiting rank ligand. It's an antibody that inhibits this pathway. Uh, but we also have another one um, that's coming out, and we think FDA approval is probably going to be uh, later next year in 2017 called Romazosumab. It is an antibody to sclerostin. And it is an anabolic agent, so it does stimulate bone formation. And so this is kind of like a kindergarten picture of how uh, osteoblast and osteoclast works. It's much, much more complex than this, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, this is good for how, how pro, uh, denosumab works. Uh, so it inhibits this rank ligand pathway. Uh, so osteoblasts uh, is, are the bone forming cells in the, in the body, uh, but with these premature osteoblast cells. Uh, the premature osteoblast cells actually stimulate this rank pathway and stimulates more osteoclast formation. And osteoclasts obviously are bone, uh, bone breaking down cells. Uh, so the nosumab blocks this rank ligand, therefore blocking this pathway, therefore less osteoclast form, therefore less bone breakdown. And that's how that works. Uh, and, and I think it works very well, actually, but there are very significant differences than, than the uh, bisphosphonates, and that's what makes it so interesting. Uh, so if you, give the denos uh, if you give patients denosumab for two years, uh, the lumbar spine increases very significantly after two years. However, after you stop this medication, 12 months after discontinuation, all the bone density scores go back to baseline. Uh, so that's why, really, this drug holidays do not apply to denosumab. Uh, this is in stark contrast with the bisphosphonates, where you see that lingering effect of bisphosphonates on bone density scores. Um, and, and the reason is because there's a hyper-resorptive state after you discontinue the medication. And this is just to show you. Uh, so in the lumbar spine, total hip, and even the radius, the top line is the patients who got uh, denosumab. So you could see a very good increase in bone density in the lumbar spine after two years of denosumab use. But right after they stop it, um, the bone density goes back almost to baseline uh, at one year after discontinuation of the medication. Same thing with the total hip, same thing with the radius. Here are the bone turnover markers. Again, uh, CTX, that's the bone resorption. So you expect that to go down upon starting uh, the, the medication. Uh, right after stopping it, bone resorption markers shoot up very highly, even, even more than the, the baseline. So you get a very, very high state of bone breakdown after stopping the nosumab. Uh, the reason why this happens, we're un, unclear at this time. Uh, same thing with bone formation markers. Uh, it goes down in the beginning, and then it goes very, very high because there's a high breakdown uh, state in, in the body. Um, so, so that's one thing that's different. So drug holidays really do not apply to, to this newer agent. So since drug holidays don't apply, we really shouldn't know the long-term effects of the nosumab uh, on our patients, uh, uh, the effects on bone density and also the effects on uh, uh, the adverse effects. So there's this freedom extension study. It's supposed to be a 10-year study, but they did publish the, the data after six years, okay? Uh, the original freedom trial was the nosumab for three years, and you could see in the lumbar spine, after three years of use, there's good, uh, there's good increases in bone density compared to placebo. Uh, the freedom extension study uh, carried the nosumab out even more, and you could see, uh, in contrast to the bisphosphonates, bone density continued to increase in almost all sites uh, with continued use of uh, the nosumab. Remember, with the bisphosphonates, after about three to four or five years of use, the graphs kind of plateaued a little bit. So denosumab is interesting. In the lumbar spine, from three years, it went up 8%, and then six years, it went to 15.2%. Uh, 15 uh, so that, that, that's good news for denosumab. Uh, and these, these bottom lines is just placebo that crossed over into a denosumab uh, agent. And of course, their bone densities went up after starting the medication.
So what does that mean for fracture reduction? Um, so after the, in the first three years of using denosumab, there is a 20% reduction in non-vertebral fractures. Uh, but in years four to six, there's actually a 50% reduction. So this is definitely different than the bisphosphonates, where the longer you use this medication, uh, the more benefit that you get from this medication. Uh, whereas in the bisphosphonates, the longer you use those medications, you don't seem to get more uh, benefit from them. And even, uh, so the 10-year, uh, so this extension study just actually completed last year. It's not published, the manuscript's not out yet, uh, but they did present their data at the American Society of Bone Mineral Research last year. And after 10 years uh, of denosumab use, the T-scores continue to rise. Uh, so at the end of 10 years, the lumbar spine T-scores was 21.7% increased uh, over baseline, and in the total hip, there was a 9.2% increase over baseline uh, in the, uh, the T-scores. Even more reassuring was that in this 10-year study of, uh, two, of more than 2,000 patients, there were only 13 cases of osteonecrosis of the jaw, and there were two cases uh, only of atypical femoral neck fractures. So that's important since this medication is probably something that they're gonna have to be on for long term. And denosumab, since it does uh, uh, affect the rank ligand, there's a lot of people who believe that rank, uh, the rank pathway is involved in the immune system. Uh, is there infection risk associated with denosumab? Um, there, there is a warning that it might increase the risk of cellulitis, but that was in a, in a study. Um, there was 12 cases of cellulitis in the group that got denosumab, uh, but the N was 3,886. Uh, placebo group only had one case of cellulitis, uh, so that was statistically significant. Uh, there's also data that suggests that maybe denosumab does increase or worsen eczema. Uh, so it's still tiny, but uh, it was statistically significant, and that's what gave the warning or uh, that there might be an infection risk. Uh, but there was a study done by Stopec on chemotherapy patients. Uh, so these are the most immunocompromised patients that we have in our population. And they compared denosumab, uh, the cancer uh, uh, brand name is Exgeva, and also sol solandronic acid, the cancer brand name is Zometa. And they showed that there was really no difference between denosumab, which is the rank ligand inhibitor, compared to the bisphosphonate uh, Zometa. Uh, actually, denosumab actually had less serious uh, infections than the zolandronic acid. So even as a rheumatologist, I, I'm not concerned about starting patients on denosumab even with biologic agents like anti-TNF agents and things like that. I haven't really seen uh, an increase in infection risks uh, when I start patients on denosumab. So the new agent uh, that, that's coming out, which uh, has caught a lot of eyes, something called romasosumab. This is an antibody to sclerostin. And the good news of sclerostin is that it's only found in skeletal tissue, so you uh, expect their effects to only be in, on the skeleton. And how it works is that it inhibits, uh, while well, sclerostin is an inhibitor of the Wnt signaling pathway, um, so you inhibit the sclerostin. Uh, this Wnt pathway uh, stimulates pre uh, osteocytes to become osteoblasts, and sclerostin blocks this pathway. So if you have an antibody that blocks sclerostin, it leaves the Wnt pathway unchecked, and you get more osteoblast formation, which leads to more bone forming uh, um, effects. So like I said uh, in the past, if you have more bone forming, you expect that bone resorption markers actually go uh, go up as well, too, uh, because there's more bone forming, there should be more bone breakdown. However, the studies, the early studies have shown that with romazosumab, this new agent, um, it actually increases bone formation markers, but it decreases bone resorption markers, uh, leading to very, very high changes in bone density. And some people even say that this might be the gold standard by 2021 uh, for osteoporosis treatment. We'll see, but uh, some, some people are theorizing that. So romazosumab, this is a phase two trial in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it's a once a month sub-Q injection. Uh, 
Uh, you can see after one year of use, there was 11.3% increase in the lumbar spine, whereas teriparatide, uh, which is Forteo, the only other uh, anabolic agent that we have on the market right now, that's a good agent too, but there was only 7% increase in lumbar spine bone density. Uh, and obviously, alendronate uh, is a little weaker at 4% increase after one year. Uh, and then adverse events uh, were not different from romazosumab groups and placebo groups, so that's reassuring. Um, so that, that's hopefully going to be out. There's phase three trials that just uh, came out. So, so, uh, so hopefully FDA approval uh, by the end of next year. So finally, I'm gonna talk about parathyroid hormone, hormone briefly. Uh, so this is the anabolic, the only one we have on the market is teriparatide, which is an anabolic agent. It's Forteo. I think it's a good agent. Um, it's not the most practical agent. It is a once a day uh, injection. Uh, that patients have to do, and, and since most of our osteoporosis patients are elderly, uh, they have a difficult time uh, getting on board with a daily injection. Um, also, uh, you could only use this agent for two years because uh, after two years in rat studies, it has been shown to increase risk of osteosarcoma. Uh, we haven't seen it in human uh, data uh, or human patients or human cases that I know of, uh, but in rat studies, uh, it, it did show increased risk. So you can only use it for two years. Um, so that's why drug holidays don't really uh, apply to parathyroid hormone. Um, and and it's also not a great agent for the hip. It's very, very good for, for the lumbar spine, uh, but the data for the hip is not that great for teriparatide. However, there is a new agent coming out uh, called abaloparatide. Uh, this is actually a recombinant, mar uh, recombinant, recombinant molecule of PTH-related protein. And the, change, the difference between ab abaloparatide and teriparatide is that it causes lower bone resorption, uh, leading to greater bone mass, less hypercalcemia, and in a comparison trial, a balperitide was given sub-Q monthly, and they had increases of the lumbar spine more than teriparatide, and also a balperitide actually is better on the hip than teriparatide. Um, also, uh, they're also doing uh, studies on a, um, a patch for a balperitide as well, too, uh, so for patients who don't like to do injections. So because uh, teriparatide, or Forteo, is an anabolic agent uh, and a bone-forming agent, there was hypotheses on uh, maybe if you combine a bone-forming agent with a anti-resorptive agent, uh, maybe you get better bone density results. Uh, so an early trial with teriparatide and alendronate uh, did not come out very good. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the effects actually counteracted each other, so it wasn't that great. However, a newer study uh, with teriparatide and denosumab actually suggests that it might help. Uh, there's greater increases in lumbar spine and, and hip bone mineral densities after two years of use than either therapy alone. And you could see the numbers, the combination therapy had 12.9 and 6.8% increases after two years in the L-spine and femoral neck. Uh, whereas the nosumab had only 8.3 and 4.1, and teriparatide had 9.5 and 2.8 after two years of use. So uh, combination therapy might help. Uh, good luck with the insurances getting both of those uh, approved since they're very, very expensive medications. And finally, the take-home points. Uh, so who we should be treating for osteoporosis, anyone who's defined uh, osteoporotic, so less than negative 2.5 on, uh, on their T-scores, and anyone, especially the elderly patients who had fragility fractures and compression fractures, you should be treating them for osteoporosis. Um, any osteopenic patient, so their uh, bone density scores are negative one to negative 2.5, and if they have a FRAC score, 10-year major osteoporotic fracture risk of eight, over 20% or 10-year hip fracture risk of over 3%, you should be treating for osteoporosis. Because there's a residual effect of bisphosphonates after discontinuation and because there's increased risk of atypical femur fractures with longer duration of bisphosphonate use, this equals that drug holiday in, for bisphosphonates might be appropriate in some patients, but obviously not all patients. And some of the patients who probably aren't the best for drug holidays 
are the patients that might be a little bit older, over 75 years, uh, history of fractures, especially in the vertebrae, because that was the only one that was statistically significant, uh, that there was a fracture reduction risk in those trials. And then the T-score, if it's still less than negative 2.5, you should continue treatment. Uh, but if, uh, if you're giving bisphosphonates and their bone density is still less than negative 2.5, it might be time to switch to one of the newer agents. And then drug holiday obviously should not be permanent. Uh, reassess the need to restart therapy. Obviously restart if there's a new clinical fracture and restart treatment if after two years you take a bone density and the total hip T-score is over 3% decreased. The long-term denosumab data is, is, looks pretty good. It shows continued T-score increases uh, and low risk of adverse effects. Uh, Teraparatide, which is a bone-forming agent, combination with the nosumab suggests it can help, uh, but again, good luck with the insurances. And then promising data on the emergent agent, emerging agents, the romazosumab and avaliparatide. There's my references. Thank you. Questions? Sure. The question was, is there a unified position statement from the dental associations and the rheumatology associations on what to do with the patient who has significant uh, T-scores uh, with osteoporosis currently being treated with, let's say, Fosamax, what to do with that patient in advance of multiple tooth extractions? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. Um, there, there isn't any combined um, uh, statements from either rheumatology association or there, there's really actually no guidelines for, for any uh, society uh, on this scenario. Um, what I would say, if they have a very high risk of, uh, of fractures uh, and, and they're going for dental work, I usually don't start them on, on any bisphosphonate therapy until after all their dental work is done. Um, now, if they're already on uh, some bisphosphonate treatments, uh, then you have to discuss uh, the, the risks uh, and the benefits with them. Obviously, if they keep having multiple fractures prior to the medications and uh, then they stopped having fractures after they started the medications, you're going to have to tell them, look, you know, if you want to stop this medication um, uh, because you're getting dental work, uh, you might have an increased risk of the fractures again. Uh, and it's, it's a real discussion with the patient, uh, and, and it's all risk and benefits. Unfortunately, we don't really have any guidelines right now uh, to, to, to help us um, uh, go further. Can you comment on the severely osteoarthritic patient who has great T-scores and uh, they have one lumbar vertebrae who's got a T-score? Minus 3.2. Comment on the patient who has severe osteoarthritis, uh, whose T-scores continue to improve year after year, but you're, you're knowing that there's got to be some osteoporosis going on just by the frailty look in the patient. So how yes. do you monitor that patient for therapy? Yeah, so it's, it's very uh, difficult to monitor uh, severe osteoarthritic patients. We do get a lot of these, and, and uh, severe degenerative disease in the spine actually leads to falsely elevated uh, T-scores. Um, so, so sometimes uh, you, see, you see a patient that you know uh, has a very bad osteoporosis, um, but um, they, 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 they have a T-score that's normal in their lumbar spine. Um, I, I try to go more by the hip. I think the hip is a little bit uh, a better predictor uh, than the lumbar spine. Um, but uh, you know, if, they, if they've had compression fractures in the past, uh, they're, they're already at risk for having further compression fractures uh, going further on. So, so you, you know you want to continue uh, treatment for these patients. How do you decide what agent to put a patient on? Because it looked by your data that you thought Prolia might be a better agent than the bisphosphonates. Well, yeah, I think so right now. Um, definitely a much stronger uh, agent, I think, than bisphosphonates, or at least a little bit stronger than the bisphosphonates. I usually start with bisphosphonates first. Um, I, I think Prolia is, is a good agent that you could use, but it is still fairly new, okay? Even though the 10-year data looks pretty good, it, it, is, it was only FDA approved in 2011, so Prolia is still uh, a youngin in terms of uh, an agent. Um, 
Also, uh, I think uh, Prolia, since you can't really stop the medication, uh, I don't like to put uh, younger patients on, on Prolia just because, uh, you know, if they're 55, uh, 50, you know, mid-50s and I have to start them on Prolia, they might be on it for the rest of their lives and uh, I'm not quite sure what the, what the longer studies are going to show in the future. So I usually still start with bisphosphonates first as long as they tolerate it, uh, but I, I don't really have too much of a hesitation to go to Prolia if patients need it. If you have a patient who has significant uh, osteoporosis who suffers their first fracture and they're naive to osteoporotic uh, therapy, is your drug a first choice post-fracture for Teo? Uh, depends. Depends on the fracture. Um, uh, like I said, uh, Forteo doesn't have good data on hip fractures. So if they uh, suffered a hip fracture, I would probably uh, not really use Forteo. Um, Prolia might be a good option for them. And plus, if they are 90, they, they might not want to inject themselves daily anyway. Um, so, so I think, uh, you know, if they're really, really osteoporotic, Prolia might be a better choice uh, for them. Uh, if, if it's a hip fracture. Now, compression fractures are different since uh, the, the data for Forteo is much, much better for the, for the lumbar spine. Um, if they suffered a compression fracture, or if you see like two or three compression fractures on them, Forteo might be a good, and orthopedic uh, uh, doctors really like uh, Forteo a lot because they, they, there is some data that might suggest that it could uh, speed up the healing of uh, compression fractures. Um, so, so they like uh, Forteo a lot, uh, and, and so if they had a compression fracture or multiple compression fractures, I might choose Forteo uh, first, uh, and, and that would be based okay. on the scenario. And my last, my last question is, when you have a patient who's been on the um, alendronate for five years, mm -hmm. and let's say their T-score improved from a minus 3.8 down to a minus 2.8, put them on a drug holiday, how long do you do that drug holiday, number one? And number two, when you do start them on, let's say, a subsequent agent, um, would your first choice be um, Prolia? Uh, so, so if it went from a negative three, uh, just uh, I guess, if it went from a negative 3.8 to a negative 2.8, uh, since they're still in the osteoporosis range, uh, that, that's one of the patients that probably you're not recommended to, uh, to be on a drug holiday uh, for. Um, but let's, let's change the numbers up a little bit. Let's say it went from a negative 2.8 to a negative 2.2, and their frac score is still elevated. Um, you, you probably still want to continue, since there was a response with the bisphosphonates, uh, you might want to continue the bisphosphonates uh, further, uh, be, especially if they have a high risk of vertebral fractures, like I said. Um, for a patient whose score, let's say it was negative 3.8 and it, it brings it up to negative 2.8, I think for those patients, you really do want to start using a different agent since, uh, like I said, the bisphosphonates doesn't increase the bone density more than five years, so you might want to start using a Prolia or even a Forteo at that time. Uh, so so that's, that, that would probably be useful. What are the options in assessing a patient's bone density if they cannot take a DEXA scan because of, uh, let's say, a metal fusion in uh, L345 and a double hip replacement? Yeah, so, you know, our options aren't great, you know, but they do have, like, the radius, uh, that there's these portable uh, bone density machines uh, that you could use. So I think the next best would be the, the radius. Uh, uh, as an option. Um, obviously, if they had a double hip replacement, um, you're really not preventing hip fractures anymore, but uh, for, for bone dense, for, for lumbar spine or compression fractures, uh, you, you kind of take that radius uh, into consideration and, and, and use those numbers. Uh, the data for radius is a little difficult to interpret, uh, but in a patient like that, that's the only thing we really have, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you ever use the uh, 35 milligram weekly dose of Fosamax, especially in those patients that have been on it for five years, maybe have osteopenia, and have a FRAC score that's still high? Uh, 
I don't, uh, I, I don't really use the 35 milligram uh, uh, alendronate too much. Um, I, I know patients that are on it. Uh, I just kind of continue them on it a little bit. Um, you know, th those are more for osteopenic and, and prevention of osteoporosis. Uh, uh, that, that's the approval for that dosage. So I don't really use it that much. Um, for, for those patients, they don't really see me for, so I, I don't really get those patients. But I know it is used a little bit. And I don't really know the data on how well it is after, you, uh, after you've had a bisphos or like a lendronate for s uh, 70 milligrams once a week for five years or so. So unfortunately, I don't think there's any data on that uh, regards.